Dev, I'm so excited to kick off our next session of our pre-symposium panel. We are going to be talking about how to build a culture of embracing mistakes. Essentially, what can we do to best serve our teams, best serve our people, build a culture where people are developing themselves and, and more or less being open and having the psychological safety to be open about the mistakes that they're doing. This is all in preparation of our executive symposium, which will be going on on July 27th in Austin, Texas, in downtown Austin at Accenture from 5 to 8 p.m. If you are interested in attending and meeting these three lovely panelists we have here today, please RSVP in the comment section and put the uh, the link in the chat to dive in with these three, Hillary Cawthon, Harper, Roxanne Lasso. I'm so excited to kick off and get started and dive in. Hillary, do you mind just introducing yourself? Hillary James and Roxanne, do you mind introducing yourselves? Of course. Um, yes, I'm excited to be here and uh, learn and discuss as we go on, but I am a clinical sports psychologist. I have a private practice, um, Texas Optical Performance and Psychological Services based in Austin. Um, our focus is really on the continuum of care model where we work with athletes and high performers, um, either in mental health, mental illness, preventative mindset, or on the optimization side um, to launch them into the successful endeavors that they're working on. Um, and then a niche area really is within organizational wellness and developing leadership and uh, high-performing cultures. Very cool. And you and you do work with Austin FC. And so one of the cool things that I observed was I'm thinking of Dr. Sharon from Ted Lasso. For anybody who's watching this that watches that TV show, that's essentially you. <laughs> yes, that is essentially me. Very cool. James, how about you? Well, I am the founder of Quatronics, and we are a company that makes uh, environmental sensors and controls and also agricultural software. So thank you for having me this morning, Garrett, and I'm looking forward to uh, talking to uh, Hillary and Roxanne about how to build a culture of embracing uh, failures and uh, moving on, I guess, to improve. Very cool. And then Roxanne, how about you? Yeah. Hi, everybody. So Roxanne Lotso, uh, I'm an industrial organizational psychologist. Uh, I've worked primarily in the talent strategy and people analytics space most of my career, but I'm also a certified executive coach. So I work a lot around leadership development and employee listening. I'm super excited to be joining everybody today. Very cool. So let's kick off. So topic, how to build a culture of embracing mistakes. I think one thing that I observe often with a lot of leaders is They've read all the books, especially like the senior leaders at the very top of an organizational chart or hierarchy. They've read all the books. They've done all the things. And sometimes it feels like by osmosis, because they've done all the reading and all the research and all the development on themselves, that everybody that they touch shall imbue this wisdom and knowledge of how to be a great leader. And that doesn't always happen in the workplace. And so when we're talking about building a culture of embracing mistakes, I'm talking about transcending this beyond just the CEO who's done all the research and the, the work on themselves, but to everybody else on the team who may not have been educated on those things, may not even know why it's important to build a culture of embracing mistakes. And so I'd love to learn from you all in no particular order, but what have you found to be an effective way to go about transcending a message from the executive team throughout the entire organization to get anybody, everybody to truly internally buy into why this is important for any cultural change or any cultural shift? Yeah, so I'll I'll kind of give my two cents. And I, I guess I want to start out with a, a hot take on your perspective, which is you can have a CEO or any executive read all the books, and that has little to no correlation with whether or not they're building a culture of embracing mistakes, right? I think there's so much more to a leader. And by leader, I mean from CEO down to, you know, the, the frontline person working on the lines, right? Building a culture of embracing mistakes is really around psychological safety, which you mentioned a little bit earlier. And really that has to happen at every level of the organization. And in an ideal world, it's trickling down, but the reality is that's not typically how it happens. So I think we all need to think of ourselves as leaders and really create this culture of inclusion and belonging and openness. So everybody, regardless of what level they're at, regardless of who they report to, regardless of what company they work for, really feels safe to fail and know that it's really a learning opportunity versus a, a, a mark on your record. Mm, I really like that. Interesting. So just kind of as a follow-up question to that, because I think it's really fascinating, because you bring up this point, because I have definitely seen this. Leaders read the books, they've, they've done things. So that, theoretically, if they were to be tested or quizzed, 
on what should you do if you were proposed in XYZ situation. They know the right answer, but when it comes to the application to their team, they struggle. How do you suggest employees call out their leadership when they're not acting in consistency with the things that they know they should be acting consistently with? Oh my goodness. That's that's a really tough one because I think there's there's so many factors involved, right? And so a lot of employees are never going to feel comfortable doing that unless they have that established trust and relationship. And the reality is there are some leaders who are going to be open to that feedback or that conversation. And there are some who are not, right? So it goes, it's not even 50-50, it's 100-100. When I think about the employee-manager relationship, you have to have that foundation of trust or you have to be very bold and confident in yourself to provide that upward feedback. But you need to also know how to do it in a way that's more constructive. So part of my background is in leadership assessment. I worked for Hogan Assessments for a long time. If anybody's familiar, so a lot of personality assessment. And I've coached CEOs and I've coached entry-level people. And really a lot of it is around becoming comfortable and knowing how to have a more challenging conversation without creating a threat or a defense mechanism in another person. So there's no simple answer is, is my answer to that question, right? There really has to be on both sides of the equation, that openness and that safety and that comfort with having those challenging conversations. Hillary, James, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think with the first part, I have such a strong desire to create the psychologically safe and secure cultures that exist. And I do think this like failing, you know, we have to all embrace that. And we have to grow from that. The growth mindset aspect is, is really genuinely true. However, I think it's this pop culture. We're missing the mark. We're, we're labeling that we're doing this and we're actually not teaching our leaders in how to create a growth environment through the process of failure and learning. Um, we have very traditional leadership styles still in place and the personality traits that, you know, Roxanne speaking to as well are prevalent that we think are what is the best environment to create this. And oftentimes we don't see people being accountable. We don't see people living the values that they preach. And, you know, one avenue that I really push for is to start this has to be a common language. It has to be a common language across the system. What, whatever role you're in in this organization, we have to know what the values are, speak the same way, have accountable affirmative care through that process and, and really switch the dynamic, right? Like I believe creating this culture of care, right? For culture champions is kind of my motto. Um, but I think we're missing the mark. It, it's We've seen that we keep saying this process, we keep building on growth mindset and failure and learning. And in my world, the dynamics, like, Failing is really bad. Like it's binary, it's win or loss, right? And failing can be very problematic. And, you know, this debate of our lessons learned through failure and you learn more, like, I don't know, we're more optimistic when we're successful. We are more open to learning and being creative and taking risks when we win. So it's it's a really hard dichotomy of what you're pushing and you truly have to understand and define what does it mean in your world for failure? What does it mean to be accountable and caring and creating a safe place to then own your actions? Mm, I like that. I've got a, I've got a follow up question to that. But before I ask that, I, James, I'd love to learn your your thoughts on just building a culture of of embracing mistakes, but also just even the follow up. I, I absolutely agree yeah. about the psychological safety uh, aspect, and that psychological as a safety aspect has to be, it has to come from the top down. It's very difficult for for the run of the be all employees. Uh, that are on the on the line, so to speak, to uh, come up with that organically when there's not support from it from the top. So mm -hmm. the the big thing I think for for the leadership is to make sure that they espouse what the company vision is, strategically meaning more than a year, and tactically meaning less than a year, and operationally meaning day to day. What do they expect? What do they feel? How do they envision the company uh, being. And then once they, once they do that, then they need to show everybody else that they are also not afraid to fail. And if they fail, then they pick up with the failure and use that as a springboard for, for something better. I like that. So James, Hillary, and Roxanne, you all keep touching on this topic of psychological safety, and I think that makes a lot of sense, but I also think that psychological safety is different for different people, because I, I guess the question I have is, how do you help people overcome their conditioning? 
So as children, we grow up, we're conditioned some way or another. Maybe you grow up in a society or a culture where failure is the end all be all. I know a lot of leaders that lead international teams where you can't fail ever. If you if you fail at make a one mistake, it's done. You're cut off, you're fired, everything's the worst. So people will literally hide their mistakes to the death, like to anything to make sure that no one discovers it and try to like work day and night to solve their own problems. When in reality, if they were just open about it, everyone could rally around it together. We could work on a solution as a group. Um, how do you help people? Oh, how, how do you meet people where they're at? I guess that's the question I'm asking in terms of understanding where their level of conditioning is, how they were raised, whatever culture they're at, to then get them to a point where, hey, this is our common language as Hillary was describing, to just more or less say, it's okay that we call people out and here's how I, I build you up. Does, does that question make sense? Yeah, I think I'll chime in. Um, I like switching the mindset of actually psychological security because we can't guarantee any place to be safe as much as we intend to. So the best analogy I do is like when you're in a vehicle and the organization is our vehicle, right? We put a seatbelt, we are secure, intending to hopefully that safety. And so seatbelt, like that is supposed to be what we're saying, hey, this is how we will wrap around to make sure that you feel that you are belonging, that we know your roles, we can give you value, we can have positive reinforcement, that we expect someone to be courageous and speak up and speak out when it's needed, you know, as Roxanne was speaking of in an empathetic way, in a way that is soliciting feedback, right? Where I think leaders get it wrong. They say, yeah, I give feedback all the time, but but they're not giving feedback or the, the employee is hearing it much more as criticism because the environment is not secure and, and the individual is not secure in that place. And so, you know, I think the essence actually starts with the onboarding process of what is your role? What will you look like when you fit in here? How can we help you grow? You know, and, and letting the person be the leader of themselves and say, this is what I need to thrive in this environment. I know what is expected of me. I know that the team that I'm trying to provide for. And so, here's how I want to show up for you. And then we can help create the safety within the organization that we're working through. Uh, the, the leadership that you describe gives me chills down my back. And my <laughs> advice to those people is go to another company, right? And so, I mean, when you're in an organization, and I know this exists, right? Where leaders are like that, where they're criticizing and there's fear of retribution. Like th there's so many fundamental issues with that organization that creating a place where people are feel safe to speak up is going to be more challenging and it's probably not going to happen unless there's an intervention in a very different way, right? So I think absolutely, I, I think we have a misconception because somebody's in a, a leadership position or a C-suite position that they know it all and they don't. There's plenty of people, especially in smaller companies, tech sector, who are rising to the top based off of luck timing, et cetera, right? Not all of these people understand how to create an inclusive environment, how to create psycho uh, psychological security. And I really like that reframe of it, right? And so everybody ha still has work to do around that. Now, now I say that saying as an employee, I would love people to be in the place where they're comfortable and feel they have an obligation to speak up when they're either subject to or they witness that kind of behavior, right? It's not always gonna be the case, but it's really around how do we empower people to do the right thing and say the right thing and call out behavior in a constructive and non-threatening way that really helps to address it. And if things are really as bad as the, the scenario you described, Garrett, I mean, there's there's legal and HR compliance types of ways to really uh, start to investigate those scenarios, right? So my HR mindset immediately goes to retribution is actually not legal, right? And so like anybody who is, is threatened to be fired because of a mistake, that's actually a really, really bad behavior, right? And I think some of it, like just to get even down to the basics, is a lot of employees aren't even aware that that's not okay and that you can file a complaint and that people can be subject to um, dismissal because of that kind of activity. So we're even talking about, like Hillary said, from the onboarding phase, people need to understand kind of what their rights are as an employee. But I also think on onboarding, especially for new managers, we need to think very differently about how to prepare train onboard new managers, managers who have, who are doing this for the first time, managers who could be early in their career and are managing people with 10, 15 years more experience than them, right? That's a very unique skill to have to be able to do that effectively and to create that psychological security. So there's there's so much work to be be done at the outset to kind of create that foundation. James, what are your thoughts on this topic? Well, first, I, I think we we need to ask what the definition of failure is. Mm. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, how would you define failure, James? 
So I, I find I, I define failure as going down the road so far with uh, in, in a direction that you cost the company a tremendous amount of money, but yet you knew that the direction was the wrong direction for, for the company to begin with. So the, the, the success, the, the definition of success, the corollary to that is that you go down the road, a certain road so long, and you find out that that is not going to work out well. And then at that point, you pivot and you use the lessons learned as a springboard going forward. So I wanted to uh, also just um, build on what Hillary and Roxanne were saying about the onboarding process. I think the onboarding process is the, 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 the prime opportunity to set the tone for what's expected at the organization as far as uh, being responsible for speaking up and also giving ideas and not being afraid to make mistakes. Mm, yeah, of course. No, that's interesting. I mean, I think Hillary, James, Roxanne, you, you all, you three keep touching on the, this, the this. onboarding process. Yes, oh. be exactly true sometimes, and sometimes the details can be changed to protect the innocent. But we can tell stories of successes. We can tell stories of things that didn't work out quite as well as we wanted them to, and how we we pivoted. To, uh, to something else and use that as a springboard. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I think James, Hillary, Roxanne, you, you keep touching on this topic that I find really fascinating. One, uh, Roxanne, you brought it up, the assumption that people at the top know all, that they got there because they have got some superior knowledge that nobody else knows. And throughout the organization, it's almost like the thought is we must respect whatever they, or not just respect, we must immediately take whatever they say as fact and immutable truth that is the best way to move forward and never challenge because uh, clearly they wouldn't have gotten to this position if they hadn't already known this in this, this information. But so often people get to these points because of luck, because of they were in the right place at the right time. They had the right sponsor kind of take them up the path and maybe they didn't develop these skills but oftentimes what will happen is because they've been in that leadership role for so long or because they've achieved this title and they've been there for such a long time, they think, oh, well, I've been in this role. No one's fired me yet. I must be pretty good at this thing. And so there's almost this lack of humility. There's this maybe false hubris about their own leadership abilities, which creates uh, essentially psychological insecurity. So they, they do things they don't even realize that they're doing it and it's uh, not helpful to the culture of the organization, but because they've been doing it for so long and because they've got this lofty title, they think they deserve this credit to do these sorts of things. So how, how do you propose we help leaders build a sense of humility about their ability to grow and learn and develop themselves to be better? Yeah, I mean, I think I was building off of what, uh, you know, Roxanne was speaking up too. And I think first we have to name that each system organically, the organizations themselves are all very different. They all function differently, right? Like especially the organizations I work with, not everyone is an employee. So when we speak about HR complaints, we speak about retaliation, the legality, consultancy work is very different. Entrepreneurs, high performer, sport industry, it's not the same platitude and platform that we exist within kind of these normal organizational structures and systems. And so I think first and foremost, when we're looking at leadership, we actually have to look at the micro society of that organization itself and how it functions and how it will like thrive. So to your point, like it really starts with like, let's cut out the noise of everyone else and look within of who we are. What is our heartbeat? What's our foundation? What are the standards, expectations? And really create that space and, and have an honest you know, I think you need to have an assessment of like, how are we functioning? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? And where do we need to go from there? And there has to be more than two to three voices in that place. It has to be a process of a team that is helping create this environment. And then there has to be roles and responsibilities of who's going to be doing the work. But it can't be one person coming in and saying, here's how we have to make it better. And it can't be one person that's responsible for making the change or holding people accountable. Yeah, absolutely. And you said something, Hillary, that I just immediately kind of went to, which is you have to do an assessment, right? So I have a background in assessment. So, so if I'm going into the organization that you described earlier, Garrett, the first thing I'm going to do is recommend we do a leadership assessment across all levels 
right? And really get to understand uh, people's personality styles, what some of their biases are, what some of their potentially um, behaviors that are going to detract from creating high performance and really having a strategic conversation around that, what that means for an individual and then having like a team discussion around what that means, right? Because until you, I think Hillary, another thing you said is it's got to be like a group effort. You can't just have a onesie twosie kind of thing. You can't just have one leader come in who embodies all of this, who's magically going to change the structure DNA of the organization. It has to be a unified front. You have to have some really strong champions and voices. And of course, I'm going to go towards like, you need a data-based approach, right? A consistent standard objective way of measuring and assessing and providing feedback in a fashion um, that's scientifically validated and proven to be indicative of greater performance and being able to build high-performing teams. Mm, so I love you're taking the database approach. Mm -hmm. I, I think that makes tons of sense. How do you handle leaders when they get every, everybody loves data that's congruent with their meant like perspective of the world? And how do you handle leader? Even though you you know it's empirical, you know this has been studied over thousands of different teams and leaders. You get leaders that get feedback that show that maybe there are some opportunities for improvement and they are obstinate. How do you how do you handle that? So I, I think there's a couple things, and I'll speak from my personal experience in the executive coaching leadership development space, is that there are indicators of whether or not someone will be open to feedback, right? And if you do an assessment, depending on the assessment, there are indicators within the assessment. So I've I've coached CEOs of organizations who have very, I'll call it a very challenging profile. Uh, they have indicators that they're going to be highly resistant to feedback. They don't care what other people think. They're going to steamroll you, et cetera. So you really have to be able to finesse and kind of open the conversation in a way that is going to create for them also psycho psychological security to have that conversation. And there's different tricks you can do as a coach to do that. And I can remember one specific CEO of a, of a faith-based organization who had a very strong profile and was like the most wonderful person. But this person knew that he had those tendencies and characteristics Right. So he knew how to manage that. And he was had a very high level of self-awareness. So I think self-awareness is really the key. If a leader completely lacks self-awareness and you go to them with feedback and they look like they've been hit in the face with a two by four, that's a bigger problem that you have to deal with. Right. And there, there's no assessment in the world that's potentially going to help you solve that problem. So, again, it's, it's not a one size fits all approach. Um, but there are ways and tricks to kind of get people more comfortable. A 360 in an organizational setting is another great way. A leader might think they're wonderful, and then they see all these ratings from teams, clients, peers, customers, and say, no, actually, this person is kind of a real jerk. Then, oh, my God, I had no idea. That's how I come across. Mm. Yeah, I like that. That's interesting. James, what are your thoughts on these topics? Thing with the 360 is that in a lot of cases they don't give you feedback as to what you can do to to improve. It's more along the lines of what's what's wrong with you, and and I think to get the feedback for improvement, it's it's important for a leader to build a horizontal um, a horizontal network of, of of people within the organization that he or she works with regularly or speak with regularly and that 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 goes all the way from the janitorial staff to the the entry level person right out of school to someone who's uh, close to retirement and it's good to build these 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 relationships one-on-one -on -one. and i think it's also good to build them in a team environment where the leadership uh, often will set on as a member of a team that is several layers below where their title is. And that way they see what's going on in real time. And at the same time, they, by participating in that situation, they, I guess, make themselves a lot more approachable and people don't view them as infallible as much. And, and then, then they won't view themselves that way as much either when they're in that that kind of situation. Obviously, we need to respect the chain of command and, and uh, so forth. But all that idea is a lot of skip level and a lot of one-on-one -on -one and group uh, group uh, meetings at the lower levels. Hillary Roxanne, what are your thoughts on what James has shared? 
Yeah, I mean, I it, it brought me to this idea, um, and I even pinpoints it, the aspect earlier of like, what is failure, right? And like, what about 360 feedback? And and for me, it's much more of a, that's one avenue of feedback, but then there has to be a lot more reflective process, especially because in a high performance domain settings, it's based on the outcome, right? Wins, loss, draw, but, you know, what do you do and reflect from that and have growth? And so, um you know, you might set up these systems where you're reflecting right after and you, you know, you work through the process, and you know, how do we, how do we grow from this, but that can be very stagnant as well if it's very systematic. And so we have to be mindful of, are we creating a culture of learning? Are we creating a culture of growth? And then with the process that we have set in place that we know we review here and we talk about these things, it's not the same voice always doing the leading of that reflection. And I think that to James's point, there's individual components that can reflect, you know, there's small groups that can reflect, there's an overarching group that will reflect, but, you know, you don't lose sight of the feedback and the reflection, but it can't be in an environment that is not instilling a place to learn and create and have space to share ideas and values of what they're learning. So Hillary and, and Roxanne and James, how do we attribute credibility to what somebody says? How do we go about, I, I guess there's this book called Principles by Ray Dalio. I don't actually agree with all the things that he writes in this book, but he talks about this thing called a dot collector. And essentially what this dot, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially what this dot collector does is it attributes credibility to somebody based on something that they've shared. So if what they've shared was factual or ended up being beneficial to the person um, or to the thing that was, uh, being reviewed, they essentially attribute dots, which adds to their credibility when they've got a future perspective on something, especially when it's challenging. And if you're wrong about something, or if it turned out to be not beneficial, you lose a dot. And it's very black and white. I, I think it's perhaps maybe a little too black and white, but it's a fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating way about attributing credibility to what people are saying. So that we're not just giving great credibility to somebody that's consistently wrong about things like over and over again. Um, but yeah, what are your thoughts on, what are your perspectives on how do we go about attributing credibility to um, what perspective somebody has to say and how seriously we should be taking that, that feedback? Well, I, I think tied into the notion of credibility is also the notion of authenticity, right? So I think if you're authentic in your approach, and that can mean a lot of different things, right? But the more authentic you are in providing feedback or in giving a perspective or uh, what, whatever it may be. I, th I think the credibility comes with that. It's it's actually really easy to see if somebody's not being authentic. Like that type of behavior is really hard to fake over a long period of time. So I think they're really tied in together in terms of that. And I think the, the more authentic you are and just the more real human person you are when you have these conversations, I think the more credibility, regardless of your, if you're right or wrong all the time, right? Um, I think the more credibility you'll get with any individual. James Hillary, what are your thoughts on on how people build credibility within an organizational setting? Well, the last symposium in Dallas, one of the one of the panelists mentioned the nine five nine five nine five rule, which means that ninety five percent of the information is shared with ninety five percent of the people ninety five percent of the time, and if you don't have information sharing, what you end up with is people make up stories. And then they make up reasons for those stories. And then suddenly a whole new reality is formed. So to build credibility and trust, the, one of the big, big pillars is to make sure that you share information with people as much as possible. That's, that's number one. And number two, of course, is uh, you, you do what you say and you don't say one thing and then go down a completely different path. Because at that point, nobody listens anymore. Yeah. First, Roxanne, I thought you were going to say data. And so data builds credibility, but we didn't go there. Um, I think, you know, we we are missing the human nature aspect of it, right? Like we are humans and we are feelers. And so there's a difference of factual knowledge and having the facts behind it that can lead to credibility. But there's also this feeling-based approach and the values and, and how you make someone feel and how you interact with them through the relationship process and the, the reliability of you showing up, right? And so I think there is a lot of factual knowledge that you have that builds credibility. There's also about how 
how you make people feel and make them feel trusted and secure and heard and seen. And then there's you being reliable and doing what you say, right? To build off what James says. So I think it's there's facts, feelings, and doing that lead us into building credibility in different avenues for people. I think that's interesting. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, we've talked a lot about like the top level of an organization, really trying to get the CEO or the C-suite or the senior most people within an organization to buy into this idea of embracing mistakes. And I definitely think that y'all brought up some really fantastic points about how can we go about uh, building not only that credibility, but also building that psychological security and getting people to be comfortable with that. But how do we transcend that to middle management? Because even when we propose some of these ideas to middle managers, you'd still get a lot of that, perhaps maybe obstinance or pushback of just, ah, you know, I don't know if I really need this. Our team doesn't really need this. I don't know if we really like we're, we're fine. Everything's fine. Like we're, we're just we want to keep everything steady, like as if it's a a, a toy in a box that's never open and we just don't want to touch it because we don't we want to preserve its value but uh, ultimately we know that there are opportunities for improvement and yeah how, how do we go how do you go about getting that from a from a middle management perspective getting them to buy into these sorts of ideas and these perspectives so I, it, uh, like a directive CEO at the top, like you must do these things. Like, how do, how do we go about getting them to truly be like, I want this. This sounds good for me. So I, I think, so I hear that kind of thing. I've heard that kind of thing. Like we don't need it. I'm amazing. My team's doing great. Well, of course, Hillary, there's a data aspect, right? So if you do any sort of sentiment measurement at work and like, I, I've done this every company I've ever worked out, I can find a flaw in that thinking like for any single manager, right? Every single manager in the world has an opportunity to do something differently. I think the second really important thing, and I know the world's kind of getting back to normal now in terms of post pandemic, but that really changed everything around the concept of mental health and burnout. And, you know, go to LinkedIn, look at anything. Everybody's talking about burnout, right? And so I think the fact that there's just a different kind of like psychological well being aspect to people working now and some people being mandated to go back to the office when they told they would never have to. Um, for women, it tends to be a lot harder for different reasons, right? So I think any manager that doesn't think they have work to do on their team or that they uh, understand all of the perspectives of every single employee with every different background on their team is out of their mind, right? Like there's always feedback or conversation or things that you don't know and don't understand. And I think if we don't pay attention to that, and if you have a group of managers that don't pay attention to that, they're just doing themselves, the organization, and their teams a, a massive disservice, right? And so I, I think a lot about Microsoft. Kathleen Hogan, their CHRO, wrote this really great article um, pretty recently. And you know they've talked a lot about like languishing and burnout. And there's another word I can't think of the top of my mind that they talk about, but just they do such a good job of assessing and measuring it and proactively addressing it for their employee base. Like, what if all companies did this? Right? Um, were really proactive about assessing, um, determining what perceptions are, how people are feeling, providing different types or more resources around this, what a different type of organizational culture you might have if you did that. Mm, I love that. Um, Hillary James, what are your thoughts on how can we empower our middle managers to buy into these some of the, these some of these topics of just building that that culture that embraces mistakes? Well, I think just having that viewpoint that it's a top-down approach, the hierarchy approach is wrong, right? Like there are flat structures, there's bottom up, right? There's leading from the front, leading from within in the middle, there's leading from behind. And so I think it's not a top-down approach anymore. There has to be leaders within each area that's more flat and ownership of kind of their group, their dynamic, their roles of what that those members are feeling and needing and, and, and actually understanding the people within the organization, right? And so I think it comes back to not just the decision making or the vision of it that we decide, but it's the people within that make us who the organization is and knowing the people to then have them have their voice, right? So it's this living leadership that Roxanne started from the very beginning that everyone is a leader in their own right. Everyone is there in their role for their own purpose and to really let them be the shining voice of this and get rid of the top down approach and actually have it be individual component ownerships of a system that work together to create the bigger outcome of what your organization is serving. James, how about you? we talked about earlier strategic versus tactical versus operational. So the strategic leadership is usually at the C-suite level. 
and the middle managers are at the tactical and operational type of level, meaning that they have viewpoints of anywhere from tomorrow up to about six to nine months out, and that, that's about it. So the big thing is to keep them aligned with that strategic vision. And when they're so busy in the weeds, it's very difficult to do that. So what I like to tell middle manager type of people is take time out and Oh, James, I think we might it's remote, it. but uh, time out, meaning maybe an hour or so a week, uh, one big block of time where they are in their office with the door closed with paper and pencil and no electronic devices. Their computer's not working, their cell phone's not working, and they need to think about the organization, what they're doing, and where they need to go with, uh, with their leadership and write it down and then come out with action plans without all of the uh, the day-to-day -day distractions of people coming in and out of the office or stopping uh, problems and putting out fires. Man, that's a really great idea, James. So if I'm hearing you right, it, it cut out just for a second, but I'm going to reiterate that what you just shared was as a leader, one thing that you can do to really amplify your ability to have a positive impact on your team is to take every month uh, pencil and paper, no electronics, and just write down what are the things that you're working on, you're working towards, and you're working to achieve with your team. And I mean, it just almost seems like a meditative practice of just being able to reflect on it because the power of reflection can be one of the most powerful things for magnifying the performance of any individual or team. Um, I think that makes a, a ton of sense. I, I've heard this term before, fake busy versus real busy. Fake busy is putting out fires, checking emails, answering phones or LinkedIn's or whatever. And you're you're doing stuff and technically it looks like you're busy, but is it having a magnifying impact on the organization? That yeah, it's movement versus progress. And we, yeah. we want progress, not just movement. That's right. That reflection activity seems like a real busy activity where you're doing something that has a, a multiplier effect on the organization and the, and the teams that you're serving. Yeah, I think that's that's really fascinating. Um, and, you know, Roxanne and, and Hillary, to your points before, if you have enough middle managers that are, oh, I've done this or I've been in this role for so long, that's how a culture of of not embracing mistakes occur. That's how a culture of perfectionism happens, where people think they must be perfect to appease my boss, because if I'm not, then I'm never going to be good enough. I'm never going to get promoted. And therefore, <clears throat> I'm never going to be getting to where I want to be professionally. And that is that is completely unhealthy. And so, yeah, building, building a sense of humility and self-awareness that I can actually be better is, is pretty critical to organizations making progress, it sounds like. And I, I just want to call it like, the world is const continually changing. So the old saying, what got you there won't keep you there. Like that doesn't work anymore. We've been a middle manager for, I don't know, five years at a company. Whatever it was that led to your success five years ago is not what's going to lead to your success now. We have a very different kind of um, employee base, right? So we tend to have a lot more millennials and younger people who are moving up the ranks in a very different way that they have before with very different perspectives, right? We have hybrid, remote, some combination of all of the above. So I think you, we really also just have to be conscious that, that things are constantly changing. And in companies, things are constantly changing, especially like the tech industry. A year and a half ago, it was a very different scenario than it is today, right? It was like throwing money away a year and a half ago. Now it's like, don't spend money no matter what happens, layoffs, right? So it's like, it's just not the same um, kind of fundamental foundation that we're working from. So we really need to be aware that it takes different things at different times to be successful. Mm. Yeah, I like that. That makes sense. Well, let's, let's change gears here just for a little bit. The other question I love to ask on these pre-symposium panels is what is a popular belief about leadership that you disagree with? So when I say popular belief, I mean over 50% of leaders, if they heard this would say, I don't know if I agree with that. Um, and perhaps, and, and hopefully, because no, nobody likes to see a panel where everybody agrees with each other. Hopefully, we've got some disagreement even within on this panel. Um, so who wants to go first with sharing a popular belief about leadership that you disagree with? I think my biggest pet peeve with uh, leadership beliefs is that the leader knows everything and the leader decides and 
once the leader decides, maybe with the C-suite uh, as, as advisors, and that's flowed down to the, the employees, and then the employees are uh, either asked or told or uh, encouraged to buy in to, uh, to the vision. And it's, it's not developed in, in, a, in a transparent type of way. And everybody is, is surprised with that. And I don't think that that's good leadership uh, skills to, to develop something in the, in the, in the background. And then even if someone comes and asks, you say, oh, well, we'll, we'll let you know when we're done. I like that one, James. That's a good one. Hey, you know, it seems when you say it, I think all of us would agree like, oh yeah, it shouldn't be made at the top, but I would care to argue for most organizations, those decisions are still made at the top by an isolated handful of few people and rolled out to everybody in the organization. And they're just expecting everybody just to buy into it, like as if they made that choice themselves. And uh, yeah, James, I, I think that's a really, really good one. Who else wants to share a, a popular belief about leadership that you disagree with? Well, I think I mean, I'll, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just going to reiterate what I said early on, which is just because you're in a, I'm just going to say C-suite position doesn't mean you're the best or you know the most or you're an amazing leader or you have humility or you have self-awareness, right? So I think it, it's a little bit tied to what um, James said, but there's like this um, kind of fundamental assumption that because, someone, because somebody is in that leadership position, that they're amazing at what they do. And I think probably everybody on this call in different scenarios has seen high level leaders who have behaved extremely badly or in ways that are just what we might consider unacceptable, right? So I think um, just that kind of assumption that because they're there is that they they know everything or they're doing everything correct. Um, I just, I, I really don't believe in that. Yeah, and I, I think mine is reader and up the first part too, um, which is like this version of the, the masculine traits. Leaders must be commanding, dominant, confident, assertive, decisive. Like that is the most effective way to be a leader. And I think that that um, is problematic, right? We see a lot more toxic things created from that masculine trait. And I don't mean man versus female, although I'm just labeling them as masculine more than feminine traits that exist. And that I think where we need to shift to um, Leaders don't need to be the loudest, the most vocal, the most dominant, the most confident, the most, you know, courageous to lead a group. Mm. I like that one. I think uh, that's another one that that's fascinating um, because it does often seem like in the workplace, the the loudest person in the room gets their message heard, not necessarily because it's the right message, but because it's the loudest message. Um Gosh, like a funny example. The first thing that comes to my mind is just an office reference. If anybody's seen The Office, there's an episode where Michael Scott and Dwight Schrute are driving to some office meeting and the Google Maps says to turn right at some road, but Michael interprets it as turning right into a pond. And Dwight's like, Michael, there is a pond right in front of us. Stop going. He's like, I'm going, following the map. And so he literally drives his car into a pond and uh, just because he really, really, really wanted to go that way. And I just... Uh, I chuckle at those scenarios, but um, I think what you're describing, though, can be true from a business perspective, because so often what you're describing is is fascinating from the building culture of psychological security, because you don't want to be on a business or in a business where you're like, we are heading straight into the ground. This is a bad decision. This person, our leader who's making these choices has blinders on and cannot see that we are going straight into the ground. And I want to say something, but my voice isn't heard. I'm being stifled. Or I feel like if I bring it up, I'm going to get, uh, there's going to be some form of retribution against me. So I don't, I don't, it's not even worth it. And that's where disengagement comes from. That's where people leaving comes from. It's, uh, that's a really good point, Hillary. Um, well, everybody, thank you all for being here. This was sweet. Is there any other final points on this topic that you'd like to share with our audience? Um, just about building a culture of embracing mistake or, or mistakes or popular beliefs about leadership that you disagree with? So I, I have to do a sports reference because Hillary's on the call. So Wayne Gretzky, famous quote, you probably already have all heard this. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So when you think about mistakes, mistakes and failures, I think are a little bit different. But if you think about mistakes, right, and creating culture where people can actually make mistakes, like if you're not trying to do something different or having an innovative or out of the box solution or whatever it might be, then like, what if you don't try it? I always think about that. And it's a coaching, it's a coaching question I ask people often too, when they're 
hesitant to do something. I'm like, well, what happens if you don't do it? Right. And so I think that's kind of like a question we all have to ask ourselves. If we don't speak up or we don't take an action, what happens if we don't even try? Right. Mm. I love that. And I think, you know, my, my last point is like, we talked about like leaders and how it's good or bad. Right. And I think we're discrediting the fact of like being in a leadership role is, is really hard in itself and, and the power and the emotional capacity that comes with that position. I think we often lose sight of the humanity in general within organizations, whether you're a leader or you're someone who's new to the company and not in that role. Like, I think we're human first and, you know, we need to actually just start seeing people as they are everybody intends to do a good job. I believe, I don't think anyone goes to work to be like, I can't wait to just mess up everything. So I think just like step, stepping back and realizing it's like when, when my athletes set goals to like, win, I'm like, yeah, of course you don't wake up being like, can't wait to lose today. Like, let's just not make that the, the decision, right? That's the obvious. So I think just bringing back humanity and like realizing like where people are and, and connecting with humans first, and then we can build off the leadership portion. Just to segue on that, I think to, to build connection, one of the biggest ways to do that is with food. Mm-hmm. And the more food that you can provide, your dividends, uh, they come back to you exponentially because you have employees that socialize with each other at different levels. They share op- ideas and opportunities. They share, share successes and failures. And they stay in the office more and they, they work harder. I love that. So it's just a win-win for everyone. That's sweet. Um, sorry, one last kind of open-ended question because you brought this up and I'm genuinely intrigued, but where do you feel like, where do you feel this concept of perfectionism comes from? This concept of I need to be perfect because I think Roxanne and Hillary and James, what you've described is we have to be comfortable with making mistakes, but there's a whole large portion of, I think the working population that feels like they need to be perfect. And you know, you'll hear character traits like perfectionist. And it's like, uh uh-uh, stay away from me. I didn't want that on my team because if you're perfect, we can't make progress. So how how can we overcome that perfectionist characteristic or get people comfortable with not being perfect? So I'm going to address this from the perspective of a uh, personality assessment, right? So perfectionism can be a strength until it's not. So you have to learn how to channel the appropriate amount of stuff. So, and perfectionism is a great example. When I work a lot with data, yes, I want my team to be perfectionists, right? But there's also a a point at which like not every single thing has to be done to the 10th decimal point, like silly example, right? So it's like, how do you use those things as strengths to enable high performance without letting them become things that are actually derailing you or preventing you from executing on high performance? And that, some of that is self-awareness. Yeah, I think you you stuck my point. Like, um, perfectionism is not bad unless it's maladaptive, right? You have the negative thinking that comes into place and you have the self-worth that's decreased. I want everyone high achiever to be a perfectionist, seeking to be the best version of themselves, right? Seeking to perform and to optimize what they have. I think why we have this is we're so extrinsically focused. We're so rewarded on these outcomes and that fuels the source of the doing part versus the intrinsic drive of learning. And so I think we need to shift the motivational portion where it's fun, it's enjoyable, the learning part is real and that drives longevity for you to keep doing what you're doing. So it, it's a balance of the extrinsic intrinsic motivation process. But if you're a perfectionist, like great, you're a high achiever, you're a high performer. We just want to be really intact. James, any thoughts on that? Perfectionism is a great trait if it's mad, if it is combined with creativity. And one of the things that we can do to build a team and um, kind of moderate that perfectionism, so to speak, is to do activities uh, that are more artistic, like uh, painting or some kind of uh, really creative uh, type of thing, maybe an escape room with a team as a, as a group activity. And that, that helps moderate the perfectionism. Or cooking. Or cooking. <laughs> cooking is great. Um, nice. Awesome. Well, Hillary, James, Roxanne, thanks for being here. This was fantastic. For everybody watching, thank you all for being here. If you were interesting, interested in meeting these three incredible individuals, come to the Executive Symposium on July 27th. 
uh, 5 to 8 p.m. We'll be diving deeper into this, this discussion of how to build a culture of embracing mistakes. We'll have case studies. We'll have uh, great networking, great opportunities to connect with other leaders, um, great panel discussions. And um, I think you're going to really enjoy it. I'll post the link in the chat to, uh, to RSVP. Thanks all you all for being here. Have a wonderful rest of your day.